Brooklyn Independent Television. Welcome to Neighborhood Beat, your passport to Brooklyn. I'm your host, Megan Brett, and on this astonishing Prospect Heights episode, we return to a community that is both scenic and stimulating. We go see documentary filmmakers Michael Galinsky and Suki Holly, creators of Battle for Brooklyn, get colorfully styled by Jimmy of Gray J Inc. Then we check out do-it-yourself bookmakers a rectangled press. And finally, grab some new American fare from a quaint and cute restaurant called James on Carlton Avenue. Stay tuned. Here on the corner of Sterling Place and Underhill is the magnificent Durier Presbyterian Church, one of the neighborhood's oldest architectural landmarks, with construction beginning in 1887 and being completed in the early 1900s. Michael Galinsky and Suki Holly are documentary filmmakers, husband and wife, and co-directors of Battle for Brooklyn, a film eight years in the making that chronicles the struggles of a man and his community fighting to save their homes during the wake of the construction of the Barclays Center Arena. We recently met up with them where we discussed their intriguing projects, past, present, and future. Michael Galinsky and I'm one of the filmmakers behind Battle for Brooklyn. My partner Suki and I have been making films together for about 20 years and we started out making narrative films, not documentaries but were documents, they're usually people playing themselves and that's when you had to shoot on film. And we had finished both of those and those were so difficult to make because when you shoot on film you need a bigger crew. And We got a video camera and we made our first documentary, Horns and Halos, uh, back in 2000 about a, an underground publisher republishing a discredited biography of George Bush. He tried to defuse questions about drug use rumors by saying he made unspecified mistakes in his youth, okay. but that he had not used illegal drugs in at least 25 years. I hope that people appreciate a candidate who comes along and says enough is enough. Enough is enough digging into people's backgrounds years ago. And that's kind of uh, the first in a, a series of films that we're, we envision in. We made a couple other films in between there, but Battle for Brooklyn is the most similar to that. And then we're starting another film called Story of Pain right now. And their films tend to be about people who are in a story in the media, and they're usually fighting something that they feel is wrong, but that the media isn't getting. And so they're kind of usually portrayed in the media as cranks and malcontents. But through filming them over many years, trying to get their message out, we are able to give a fuller picture of what they have to say. We started collaborating on student films that I was working on and then that summer we started our production on our first narrative feature. This you know, documentary subject came up actually when we were flying back from a film festival. He could just grab the camera and I could do sound and I could interview people. It would just be the two of us running around you know, shooting things and that was so liberating that that's basically how it began. When we read about uh, the Atlantic Yards project in the New York Times. The first thing I thought was, this sounds like a press release. But to me, it raised all kinds of questions, like where are they gonna build this? There's buildings there, there are people there. So I started asking my neighbors, and they all said, the governor, the mayor, what are you gonna do? Just stop, don't even think about it, because it's a done deal. And you know, from my point of view, I'm always interested in the story behind the story, so I kept asking around. And then I saw a poster on the block out here, and it said, stop the project, and there was a number. So I called Patty, and she just started talking my ear off. I immediately ran over and started filming with her that day, and I followed her as she followed, you know, she led other media people around. So by doing that, I was able to get a real sense of what the story was. This is Joe Pastore. He uh, lives in that building, I right there. the middle building since 67. More than half of his project is private property that he wants to seize. Right. Why doesn't he approach each owner and say, do you want to sell? Right. It was a long process to make this film. And when we started, we didn't know when it would end. I think Patty once asked me, you know, how long do you think this is going to take? And I said, I don't know, three or four years. She goes, I'll be elderly by then. The first six months I did shoot almost every day because there was so much going on and so much to figure out. At a certain point, it kind of fell into a pattern 
I would film as events happened in the same way that the media would. At the same time, we really wanted it to be done. But anytime you write a story, or especially when you're gonna make a movie, you can't really start editing until the story is done because you don't know where you're gonna be at the end. It became close enough to where the ending was e would either be our main character loses or he wins, and those were significantly similar enough that uh, we did start editing before we knew that outcome. We did then edit full time for almost a year and a half, and then we've been distributing for a year. Because we spent so long on it, we really feel a great need to kind of keep working with it to get that story out there. We thought of it as our next film, our second film, but of course, you know, events in ensued and we shot another whole film and finished that um, in the meantime. No one had any idea that this would last so long, that they would hold this, you know, development at bay for as long as they did. It was difficult for us, you know, be but we had to wait for the ending that came. We couldn't, you know, force it to be a different than it was. One of the things they were saying was, you know, there's this arena and, and they really controlled the message that it was this arena and everyone's, oh yeah, basketball, housing, hoops, jobs. And the people we talked to said, there's not going to be many jobs. The housing, it's not possible to build the way they're saying they're building with the numbers. It's not going to provide it. And it's going to destroy the character of all these low rise neighborhoods around it. So that's what we really wanted to do was document this process, hear what people who lived here were really saying, and then witness it so that in the future there would be a truth that would outlive what they had said. We're at the site of the infamous Carlton Avenue Bridge. They promised to rebuild it in two years. It's four years later, it's still not done. It wasn't meant to be an activist film, but to be an active film that follows the story and allows the history to exist. So we talked about before this idea of you know, if a developer spending a million dollars a year on publicity, they're going to control the narrative. But eventually the true story comes up in this age of blogs with people like Norman Oder and films like ours. The truth does rise to the surface and I do feel like we're in a changing environment where these truths are going to have relevance in the future. The next project is called Story of Pain and it's about um, the issue of chronic pain in America. But mostly it's a portrait of Dr. Sarno who wrote a book called Healing Back Pain and it just has incredible success in letting people know that most of the pain that we have in this country, which is epidemic proportions at this point, is really based on emotions and stress and not structural problems. We're actually following Dr. Sarno to a Senate hearing to talk about pain and the epidemic. He's 88 years old, so it should be an interesting trip. We were not trying to influence the stories that happened because in a way that would undermine our ability to make a movie. We felt it was more important to make a story at the end that would be relevant and not wound up as being a part of the opposition and then disregarded. It's a very hard battle to fight for us because you know you want people to know what's going on. At the same time, what was more important was making a film for the ages, a film that would remake history. Have you ever wondered why some buildings in Prospect Heights are built on a 45 degree angle from the rest of the grid? A remnant from a different street grid, diagonal angles of property lines date all the way back to the 1800s. Not only is Jimmy an amazing designer specializing in vibrant dyes, but he also started an artistic village right here in Prospect Heights called the Village at Correge. So let's go in and get styled. My name is uh, Jimmy Gureje. I am the proprietor of Gureje Inc. Here we specialize in custom clothing. We make special, everyday, casual, and occasional wear for men and women. We do a lot of color-related work. I'm an artist. I work more from interrelating colors with fabric. I do that so that it can give me a little niche in the actual form of what my shirt would look like or my pants would look like. And as an artist, I know that, I have developed that, have worked with that for over three decades. I've kind of kept the consistency that makes people kind of like take a second look at what I do. I emerged from Nigeria. The trade is very very commonly, you know, you want it, you make it. And you can pretty much see that around you. 
One very special attention that I remembering now that I used to pay is to the local dyers who are engaged in the art of dyeing fabric. I'd lost my dad when I was very young. In Africa, you left with the option of going out to fend for yourself and the family. My grandfather, he had a huge sediment, focal, coffee and all that. But his uniqueness in the way he farms gave him a nickname. That nickname is Gureje. And Gureje really is someone who really does not force things, yet allow force to force itself. I'm coming from a background with, you know, very, you want, your name is the most important thing about you. <laughs> so, you know, I'm constantly very careful with how my name gets attached to what I do. But now I felt like, well, this is really what I do and I want to do, so I need to go all out with it. So we're here with Jimmy, who has already started styling me in this very snazzy coat, which I have to admit, I don't think I would have pulled it off the rack by myself. Fine line corduroy, and also this is actually synthetic leather. Well, I'm loving this coat. I feel very pretty. But Thank you have something else for me? Oh yes, I do. I have um, the full house. I have this piece here. Ooh, uh, like very girly, girly dress type. Girly, I, I hope girl. you know <laughs> we can see that on you. So. Okay, I'm gonna go try it on. Please do that. Okay, Jimmy, you are correct. I feel like a girly girl. <laughs> I like this a lot. This is very pretty. Thank you. How do you come up with these ideas? I try not to really go with my head in terms of styling. What do you have for me next? Um, I'm looking at something quite uh, colorful. I'm very excited. <laughs> I'm liking this a lot. Thank you. I love it. I love the colors. Thank you. And I love again. You is this that straight corduroy you used? No, this is um, this is actually a woven silk that I find just looking for special fabric. Not only are they fashionable and stylish, thank you, but they're comfortable. Thank you. I saw this building. I decided, oh, well, it looks like someone wants to let it go. Put it out, divided the place up, extended the building. My friends were like, what's calling you? There's not any names. I'm not, I'm not. I said, no, this is calling me. I need to answer this building. By this time, I had bought properties here and there. I said, you don't know, it's calling me. I said, come back to where you really are. And that's how soon, before I know it, put myself in the basement here and started to build from that little basement space that I had. And while I was building each of these design, I had in the back of my head that the extended space capacity that's still under construction is going to be the outreach center for the clothing. So the back that I once called Gureje Afro Shrine, and soon it became the village at Gureje. My name is Kaoru Watanabe. I play the Japanese drums called the taiko drums, as well as uh, the Japanese flutes called shinobue, mixing uh, those traditions with jazz, more contemporary techniques. I do a lot of collaborative work with dancers, quote unquote world musicians. I had an idea, just kind of a vague notion that I wanted to be in Brooklyn. I discovered the space, uh, Jimmy asking me who I was, what I was there for trying to get a deeper questions about what I would want to get out of the space and what I could contribute to the space. So that's how I, I chose uh, to come here and it's been four years now. It's a very interesting concept because this whole space has been uh, crafted by uh, initially by Jimmy and he's had this wonderful uh, magical space for about 10 years now. He was um, introduced to uh, Ajay. Ajay came with the concept of actually implementing a functional bar uh, in this space. And it's just been a, a wonderful marriage of art and music and culture and just bringing back a scene to, to Brooklyn that has kind of been lacking. You know, I'm very careful to classify myself. I constantly try to emerge on a daily basis in what I see Brooklyn as. Brooklyn is constantly growing. And uh, we all can, you know, be a witness to that growth in what Brooklyn really is right now. 
A rectangle press is a mega artistic micro press where the scope of books are stretched, yet the size of the books are decreased. Intrigued? Let's check them out. I'm Jessica Elsesser. I am one of the members of a rectangle press. I'm also a poet. We've been making books together for five years now. I also do a form of trapeze called Lyra. We also collaboratively write everything for our books together. We were talking about creation as an act of magic and how um, my earlier fascinations with books were largely rooted in, I guess, the possibility of unexpected things happening. In my artistic endeavors, that sort of follows through, you know, finding joy and coincidence in everyday things. Gus and I went to school together at Pratt for creative writing. And there's kind of a couple different ways, like as part of our personal mythology, that the press came to be. Um, we used to have like a secret mailbox in one of the um, bathrooms there that you could open up part of a radiator and like leave messages. So we did that for a long time, and that sort of started this like back and forth. We would um, kind of do some projects where one of us would add something, and then in conjunction with that, at the same time, we came up with this name, a rectangle press. It made sense to, to use that name and to be able to do it together because neither of us kind of owned it, but we both like you know, loved it. So we got together one night and made a really small edition. That phrase has sort of embodied that idea of wanting our you know books to have a complete thread from concept to form to text. What it was then and what it's kind of continued to be is just an effort to continue making things and to be putting stuff out there that like is what we want to be saying and that is reaching other people. A lot of our work is based on um, wanting to create experiences, so that's why we have books where elements in it need to be destroyed or altered or picked open or unwrapped so that the reader is getting that feeling of participating in creating it and feeling like it's a moment that's happening right then. People ask us a lot why they qualify as books. And I think the answer is that I don't really care if they do. <laughs> the most important thing is that they be successful in conveying some emotion or sentiment or human commonality. We both are book lovers and I think those people still exist out there. There's a difference between absorbing information and, and reading and experiencing a book in that way. And you know, I know for me, I've taken books like traveling and get a wine stain on the later you go back and, and that book has a, its own like memory and its own meaning and kind of relates to the time in which you read it. The more that technology kind of infiltrates our lives and, and takes over um, kind of the day to day that things like opening a book and smelling it start to feel kind of special and wonderful. And I think that a lot of our work also relates to day-to-day -day stuff, you know, so we do a lot of, we have like the egg book or um, we have one book that's like modeled after um, matches. I think our work is pretty close to like, what am I doing with my life right now? What am I doing in day-to-day? -day? And those things are really closely related to like certain colors and textures and like feelings. And I think our books try and incorporate a lot of those elements. The more that technology becomes readily accessible, the more precious and sort of like meaningful things that can't be mass produced will be. We initially started printing receipts that were from, you know, that fictional uh, mailbox or that we had um, had in college, and it was supposed to be this mythical bookstore that you would go into and buy these weird things. And we also included, you know, a souvenir, something that you could take away from the book. All these things that were part of the book, but also symbolize the fact that it was an experience. I never thought that I would be the kind of person who could collaborate just because I get really specific about visual details and just, I mean, just everything. It's kind of been crazy because Jess and I are just, it's almost like twin speak, like we're able to finish each other's sentences. We write line by line, sometimes word by word. It's a really bizarre experience. Editing someone's work as though it were your own, you know, you just lose all fear of offending or, you know, wanting to preserve their initial idea and it's not about you know, your idea and my idea, it's about the idea. We edit like all of our writing on this um, clothesline, so like, write and edit and then look, we both wrote the exact same thing, you know. This book is called Temporary Shelters and this book is a planter, so it comes packed in dirt. It hangs like this and all of the writing is curled up inside of it. It's about the um, idea of like the human body as a sort of temporary house for like something else. 
It's like hand typed on the typewriter, so like a little caterpillar or something came in and ate it. I know a woman who still hasn't gone back for the things she didn't take with her. I know a man who only has one cup. I had a dream where everything I had ever loaned anyone was returned, and that was all I had in the world. And in another, I met someone who knew all about me, even things he said I didn't know yet. There's uh, a room in this apartment that used to look out in an air shaft, and it was um, the other side of the building, and the air shaft was inhabited by a large number of pigeons. So the first story we wrote was um, from the perspective of that spirit um, looking in through the window and remembering uh, their past um, as being alive. This side of the Lord. I'm not going to say that things haven't changed. I know you're in the room. I have the feeling I am looking over your shoulder. Instead of breathing, I become more or less solid. It happens to all of me at once. I am still separate from other things. I can still sing. This is two uh, variations on winter. It was packing material that like went in between each layer of like a billion boxes. A weight that is not heavy, but difficult to grasp. Every day we get up, brief fevers, and you need anybody who will meet you as far as you can go. And it's not far. A voice saying, that heart's not gonna beat forever. You get it in your head. What does it take to bring you out? except in an extraordinary event. You wait for it. You wait for it. Until you forget. A winter is only like an end. And that's it. <laughs> Run by husband and wife team Brian Calvert and Deborah Williamson, James is a small and sophisticated restaurant specializing in new American fare. Dishes like Carolina shrimp with roasted garlic polenta, which takes the place of shrimp and grits, are delectable and refined. Anyone else getting hungry? I'm Brian Calvert, and you're at James in Prospect Heights. We opened James about three and a half years ago. I opened it with my wife, Deborah Williamson. I run the kitchen, she runs the front of the house. Um, we were looking for a space in Brooklyn um, for a restaurant for quite some time. This was an existing restaurant also, which we happen to live above. When the owners of the previous restaurant decided to um, sell the restaurant, it really worked out well for us. The way we came about uh, opening James, Brian had been in the neighborhood in Prospect Heights for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years. We had a, another business that we were running together and we were looking for a restaurant space specifically in the neighborhood. Um, and we got lucky. We got the keys in March of 2008 and we opened in June. It's been a crazy four years and a total passion project for us and we're huge Brooklyn fans and uh, love this neighborhood in particular so we have uh, a great affinity for all of our neighbors and and the whole scene here so it's it's um, a special place for us. Uh, when I first moved here I was a poor struggling cook the neighborhood really changed with my career and there wasn't that much kind of like casual seasonal American affair here. Um, the neighborhood really wasn't ready for it back then and as I became a chef and worked in different places in Manhattan and finally was ready for my own restaurant, luckily the neighborhood was ready too. And I was so happy that it all worked out because I really love this neighborhood. Um, it's really my home and I've been here for a long time and don't plan on leaving anytime soon. We offer seasonal American, farm to table, market driven um, selections. So on any given week, the menu will be changing. We have a few dishes that people really enjoy. I kind of consider specialties. Uh, we have a really beautiful spinach salad that's been on the menu for a long time. Of course, the burger is always really popular, eight ounce black Angus burger. We also have a, a really nice cheesecake for dessert that people love. Today we're gonna to be preparing sauteed shrimp with garlic polenta and a harissa broth. Harissa broth is basically a shrimp stock infused with aromatics and harissa. First, I'm gonna take a hot saucepan and add some shrimp shells to it. 
I have some spring garlic, some lemongrass, fennel seed, chopped tomatoes, and a little bit of chopped garlic. We're gonna sweat all these ingredients together so the flavors really combine. I'm gonna add a tiny bit of harissa paste, very spicy, just need a little bit. Deglaze with a little pruneau. And then I'm gonna cover this with some vegetable stock. We're gonna make a creamy garlic polenta. I'm gonna take a little bit of butter and add some polenta. Stir it in the butter. Start adding my vegetable stock. And with a whisk, whisk it. You'll end up with something like this. Finish it with some seasonings. The garlic puree is basically roasted garlic that has been um, cleaned and pureed into a puree. Add a little creme fraiche for some creaminess. So the next step is cooking the shrimp. Vegetable oil. Make sure the pan's hot. We're gonna do about three or four pieces of shrimp. I'm gonna season this up. Now here I have my harissa broth, which is finished. And all you need to do is strain this and you end up with a nice red spicy broth like this. We're gonna take a little bit of the broth and deglaze the pan. I'm gonna take a little bit of the polenta, place it in the middle of the bowl, take the shrimp, put on top, pour the broth over the shrimp and the polenta, finish with a little micro beet greens, a little chive oil for some color, sauteed shrimp with polenta and arisa broth. The restaurant is named after Brian's great-grandfather who um, uh, came to New York in the mid-1800s and he and his wife opened a restaurant in Mount Morris and his name was James and they ran this lovely little restaurant together so the name and really the essence of the restaurant is um, homage to his family members and those culinary roots. We have a lot of stuff we're working on. We're not quite sure yet where we're going but um, I think the neighborhoods change a lot. There's a lot, of, a lot of new restaurants which is great and we welcome more people, more restaurants here and we'd like to see this community become like a restaurant destination area. So with that being said, who knows what the future will hold. I hope you enjoyed this remarkable episode of Neighborhood Beat Prospect Heights. I know I did. From the amazing stylings of Jimmy Gareje to the delectable American fair at James, Prospect Heights has something for everyone. So come on down and check it out for yourself. For more information on the Neighborhood Beat series or to view past shows online, check us out at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT. Or you can search us on iTunes and YouTube, keyword BK Independent TV. I'm your host, Megan Brett, and I'll see you around Brooklyn. Cat TV Network.